It's all in the air for Blue Watch. You done a sort of work before then. There's driving, and there's driving, and there's not driving at all. What if you came for a laugh or something? A toast for Christmas weekends. The London Fire Brigade, Blackhall Fire Station, and all who sail in her. Saturday at 10 past 9 on TVS. This is a pint of ordinary lager. And this is low alcohol lager. Now, some low alcohol lagers are around one third the strength of ordinary lager. So, three of these could contain the same amount of alcohol as one of those. Now, this is Calibre from Guinness. And because it's alcohol free, you can drink as much as you like. It was an otherwise perfect day when the full horror of the thing struck me. The lady wife's birthday. A nauseous event in itself, but on top of that is her total lack of gratitude for the annual gift. What she fails to understand is that Grace's antiquarian cricketing emporium is not exactly awash with novelties. So, with heavy heart, I join young Freddy in a scrumpy and linseed oil outside the Carter's Arms public house. As ever, talk turns to our glorious summer gay. And in exchange for a bowl of St. Bruno, I listen to his half-cocked theories regarding the full toss against the top-spin leg break. A subject unlike tobacco, he appears to know very little about. His taste in women's a bit rum, too. Braun System 123 gives you an unbeatably close shave and a totally refreshed side effect. Braun shavers. Feel the difference. Anyone who thoughtlessly gives a pet as a present could be condemning it to death. Because every year thousands of pets end up unloved, unwanted and abandoned. Call 0800-400-478. Your money could help. some of the most dangerous people in society and yet this wing has got an atmosphere of tolerance and even humor about it. Parkhurst prison houses 16 of the most dangerous men in Britain yet relations between inmates and officers are good. TVS opens the door in a potentially explosive experiment. This setup is unique to us as well. Life isn't just being in prison is it? You've got to be able to do things while you're in prison. Charlie Wing, tonight at 10.35. At 10 o'clock on this Monday, the 18th of December, we're joined by ITN. This is TVS. British passport for 200,000 in Hong Kong. Hundreds may have died as Romania's Ceausescu stamps on protest. Gorbachev praises dissident Sakharov and comforts his widow. Five die in helicopter crash as a party ends in tragedy. And the baby who shouldn't have made it does in time for Christmas. Good evening. The government intends to go ahead with new laws allowing up to 200,000 Hong Kong residents into Britain. ITN learned tonight that new full British passports will be given to those singled out as special cases. Angry Tory backbenchers said tonight that no more than 40,000 should be allowed in. They've threatened to vote against the government if that figure is exceeded. Tomorrow the Commons debates the forced repatriation of Vietnamese boat people from Hong Kong. The Archbishop of Canterbury has written to the government urging them to abandon the policy. Our political editor Michael Brunson reports. 
Mrs. Thatcher, about her diplomatic duties this afternoon, is determined to introduce new laws which could let thousands of Hong Kong Chinese settle here. She'll face turmoil within the Conservative Party for doing so, but she's determined to keep the pledge she's repeatedly given Hong Kong that a clear signal must be given which maintains the colony's confidence in the run-up to the handover to the Chinese. That, in Mrs. Thatcher's view, means giving more than just guarantees to leading people there, since the Prime Minister believes that any future Labour government would cancel such guarantees. So, I understand, a limited number of those who hold Hong Kong passports, which don't contain the right to settle in Britain, will be issued with new, full British passports, which do. Now, along with those Crown servants, judges, policemen and so on, who can come in under existing arrangements, and the plans to admit some wealthy businessmen, the total numbers coming from Hong Kong could be up to 200,000. It all depends, though, on the government getting new laws through the Commons, and there are plenty of Tory backbenchers who are absolutely determined to stop the government doing that. If we are to legislate to give these people passports with the right of abode here, I think it will strike many people as odd that those passports are to be given on a discriminatory basis, that if you're sufficiently rich, you get a passport, but that if you're not, you don't. I very much hope that the government is not going to introduce new primary legislation. And if they do? Well, uh, I shall look at the legislation, but my present intention would be to oppose it. It is also certain that Labour will vote against the government's package, but for different reasons. Tonight, Mr Kinnock's advisers say they'll oppose any package which allow the rich or the powerful in Hong Kong to jump the queue, and a combination of Labour's vote and that of the Tory rebels could mean a defeat for the government. But in an attempt to forestall that, the Liberal Democrats leader Paddy Ashdown says he'll support the government's plans to try and cancel out the effects of a Tory backbench rebellion, but only if the package brings in up to 350,000 people in all. But now there's another problem for the government. From Lambeth Palace this morning, news of the Archbishop's letter. Dr. Runcie himself wouldn't be interviewed about it, but one of his advisers summarised it like this. He said, in the long term, you can only stop these boat people moving from Vietnam to Hong Kong on these very dangerous journeys in which men, women and children are put at great risk. You can only stop that if the West stops its isolation of Vietnam. And in the second place, he's saying that in the short term, uh, the forcible repatriation should stop. But that will only happen if the rest of the world plays a part in solving that particular problem of the people already there. But it's the government's case that the International Conference at Geneva in June decided that there was no other answer to the problem than this, the forcible return of those who aren't genuine refugees. Replying to the Archbishop, the Foreign Secretary relied on that point today. Well, I haven't seen his letter, but when I see it, I shall re reply to it um, quickly. I think that more and more people, as they study the question, realize that since the international community decided in last summer, that people who are not refugees, Vietnamese who are not refugees, ought to return to Vietnam, um, it is reasonable to take steps to make sure that that actually happens. Otherwise, you'll get what I regard as in intolerable for everybody, including the Vietnamese, a fresh onrush of uh, Vietnamese boat people not being refugees into Hong Kong in the spring. Earlier today, the Tory party chairman and the business managers discussed the whole Hong Kong problem with Mrs. Thatcher. With the boat people debate tomorrow and the statement on passports on Wednesday, they all face a very tough few days. Michael Brunson, News at 10, Westminster. In Hong Kong, many residents are unhappy about remaining there after the colony passes into Chinese hands in 1997. They've always been concerned about what rule by China will actually mean. But now they also fear that last week's enforced repatriation of 51 Vietnamese refugees has worsened the position of the people of Hong Kong. Hong Kong's governor, Sir David Wilson, faced some of the colony's new university graduates today. These are the fiercest critics of the proposed limits on who will be granted the right of abode in Britain when China takes over here. It's estimated half of these graduates will join the brain drain from Hong Kong looking for countries that will offer them a better future. Few of them relish the situation they've inherited here. I think the issue does not lie with us, it lies with the British government. Yes, that's um, we have to depend on what the British government says. But they always pretend to be the gentlemen. But this time they show what, what their gentlemanship is. It's the British government to give confidence to us. Yeah. And the Chinese government too. Yeah. Nearly a thousand people a week are now emigrating from Hong Kong. This woman and her children to Australia because their passports don't give them the right to work in Britain. 
Assurances that life will be good here when China takes over are widely distrusted. If the Chinese and the British have been fooling us all along, that things are not going to work out, then of course all hell will break loose. And if they cannot get to go to London, to Britain, they will just take to the boats like the Vietnamese. Meanwhile, in the Portuguese enclave of Macau, just a few miles from Hong Kong, there's a different atmosphere. These people too will shortly come under Chinese rule. But a quarter of them have been given Portuguese passports, which gives them the right to live anywhere in the European community, including Britain. The confidence shows in the mood of these people and the booming economy, illustrated by a new airport under construction intended as a showpiece gateway to China. Hong Kong is expecting little in the way of goodwill this Christmas. They know that the policy of forced repatriation of the Vietnamese boat people has won them little support in their own fight to have a guaranteed safety net when the colony is taken over by mainland China in 1997. Norman Rees, News at 10, Hong Kong. Romania has tonight virtually sealed its borders with the outside world after a weekend of violent confrontation between police and demonstrators demanding the removal of President Ceausescu. Witnesses have spoken of hundreds of deaths in the western city of Timisora when security forces reportedly used tanks, guns and water cannon to disperse a crowd of some 10,000 people. There are also reports of demonstrations in the cities of Arad and Brazov. This from David Rose at ITN. President Nikolai Ceausescu felt confident enough today to go ahead with a state visit to Iran despite unconfirmed reports of hundreds of people being shot dead in the west of his country over the weekend. It's now clear that this was the most serious demonstration of the hatred in which Ceausescu and his regime are held for many years. Iran is now one of the few countries in which the Romanian president is still welcome. As Romania virtually closed her borders today, it's impossible to be certain exactly what has occurred in this highly secretive country. This woman had left her baby behind in Romania and wasn't sure if she'd be allowed to see it again. One man crossing into Yugoslavia today spoke of three being killed. Others have said hundreds were shot by police on the ground and in helicopters after demonstrators attacked Timisoara's police headquarters and burned books by Ceausescu. We do know that the Ceausescu uh, regime is quite willing to brutally suppress such uh, uh, pop manifestations of popular uh, unrest, unlike the East German and, and Czech uh, regimes. This is the clergyman, Laszlo Tokic, an ethnic Hungarian who's at the center of the weekend's unrest. In this recent interview, he criticized President Ceausescu. The Romanian security forces apparently tried to evict Tokic from his church, but hundreds of people formed a human chain around their minister, his wife and child. In Budapest tonight, thousands of Hungarians demonstrated outside the Romanian embassy after the Hungarian parliament had been told tanks were on the streets of Timisoara. But it's clear that many native Romanians had joined those of Hungarian descent in these demonstrations in Timisoara and other Romanian cities. Tonight, Hungarian radio was claiming over 300 demonstrators had been killed. 80,000 people braved the bitter cold of a Moscow sports park today to pay their last respects to Andrei Sakharov, the dissident and human rights campaigner who died on Thursday. President Gorbachev told Dr. Sakharov's widow that her husband's absence would be felt throughout the Soviet Union, but he assured her that perestroika would go on. With the body of Andrei Sakharov on display for the final time, ordinary Russians and great scientists alike filed by. His widow, Yelena Bonner, stood beside him, as she had done in his years of hardship. A grim President Gorbachev and the Soviet Prime Minister this morning paid their final respects. No clearer sign possible that the hounding of the Sakharov family is now seen in the Kremlin as a dark page in Soviet history. Gorbachev quietly listening to and consoling the woman who previous Kremlin leaders harangued. Friends from across the city marched through Moscow to remember the man who for two decades most disowned after he fell into official disgrace. A man who in his time was branded an enemy of the state, now a posthumous hero of its people.
At a remembrance rally, tens of thousands of Moscovites gathered. They recognize they've lost a moral leader who stood up to a system that broke so many others. Among the mourners was the leader of Solidarity, Lech Walesa. He met privately with Yelena Bonner, having flown from Warsaw to pay homage to a man who had inspired his own fight for political freedoms. As darkness fell tonight, Sakharov was buried in a simple cemetery, his family and friends alongside him. No one, not even officials, have questioned those who called Sakharov the conscience of the nation. His death deprives people not just of a human rights activist, but of a champion of reform and social justice throughout Europe. Robert Moore, News at 10, Moscow. Here, five people have been killed in a helicopter crash in Kent. It was on a private charter flight when it came down in bad weather shortly after takeoff from Biggin Hill Aerodrome. The helicopter crashed into an area of dense woodland just minutes after taking off from Biggin Hill Aerodrome in driving rain and blustery winds. Air traffic control at Biggin Hill believes the pilot had flown suddenly into low cloud and with visibility almost zero tried to turn round and return to the airport. It was making such a terrific noise. So I looked out of the window and just saw it go over into the trees and it just nosedive and just spun round and round and disappeared. There was no noise, no, just nothing, no smoke, no fire. Police say the four passengers en route to a celebration Christmas lunch at Folkestone Racecourse died instantly. Three are from London. The pilot, who also died, has been named as Ike Eze, a 29-year-old married man from Kingston-on-Thames. Well, the accident investigation units have obviously got to start their inquiries to find out how the accident happened, and that will involve con contacting all sorts of people like the Civil Aviation Authority to find out if any messages were passed to and from the helicopter just before the accident. As darkness fell, an arc light was brought to the scene and a grid search of the area began. The area of the crash behind me is now lit by a single police floodlight as a specialist team from Heathrow examines the site for clues as to the cause. But working in often dense woodland and darkness, police believe it'll be many hours yet before even all the wreckage is located. James Forlong, News at 10, Biggin Hill. Four Iranians are still being held by police in Manchester after being arrested last Friday under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. Their solicitor claims they're being held on suspicion of being a hit squad to kill the author Salman Rushdie. Our North of England correspondent Terry Lloyd has this report. The arrests were made on Friday after this meeting took place in Manchester where renewed calls were made for the death of author Salman Rushdie. According to the men's solicitor, they've told him that detectives have questioned them about an Iranian hit team out to find Rushdie. Members of the Iranian community in Manchester say talk of a hit team is nonsense. One of the arrested men lives here in southern Manchester. His British-born wife described what happened when the police arrived at their door. They just said my husband was under arrest for suspicion of terrorist activities. And they just came in the house and um, took my husband in the kitchen and just said that they was arresting him. <clears throat> and then a lady came in here and searched me and they just took my husband away. And then about eight of them um, all in boiler suits, police came in and searched everywhere. Three of the men are students at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. Two of them are known to be researching an engineering project. The men were originally held for 48 hours, the maximum allowed under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. The detectives later applied to the Home Office for an extension, which was granted. Tonight, the men are in custody here in Stretford, but police will reveal no other details other than to say that four Iranian males are helping with their investigation and inquiries are continuing. Terry Lloyd, News at 10, Manchester. Northern Ireland, with the highest rate of unemployment in the United Kingdom, got a big jobs boost today from the United States. How the bucks from Boston could transform the bog side, a report in part two. Plus, P&O ferries face corporate manslaughter charges over Zeebrugge. And 20 ounces at birth should have spelt disaster. How hope and care brought her through, that's in a couple of minutes.
Go meet off then. I will now. I just love it when a man drinks White Label. White Label, no alcohol bitter. You can drink it to your heart's content. When you feel you want the taste of something intriguing and delicious, taste Amaretto di Saroma. Other eyes or on its own. Intriguing, fascinating, delicious. The original Amaretto di Saroma. We would normally prefer to show you someone enjoying one of our products. But we realize there are times when you'd rather enjoy someone else's. All we ask is that you don't do both at the same time. Up to 1,500 jobs will be created in a major redevelopment in Londonderry in Northern Ireland, where one man in three is now out of work. The multi-million pound scheme will include a world-class trade center and business park. This report from our island correspondent, Andrew Simmons. The 65 million pound deal is the biggest single investment in the city for more than a century. It will bring jobs to one of Northern Ireland's most depressed areas where nearly a third of the male workforce is jobless and the overall unemployment average is 22%. Nearly half of the capital is being put up by an American development company, O'Connell's, Announcing the deal today, Northern Ireland's Minister for the Economy, Richard Needham, said new jobs bring fresh hopes for peace here. If you can find people jobs, if you can give them hope and opportunity and work, and you can produce quality, uh, then of course uh, people will live easier together. This project is most notable as a vote of confidence from the international private sector. And already other major names have become involved, such as Marks and Spencer and the Trust House 40 hotel chain. Behind the deal lies a project linking Londonderry with Boston. Local people campaigned for American money to be put into economic aid instead of funding violence. Twenty years ago, remember, when we were starting out in this city looking to change, we've, we've got our one man, one vote. We have transformed the housing of the city. There have been many factors preventing us, including the unrest, from bringing in investment. Now we're starting to bring in investment and tackling the unemployment problem. The new year will bring the first stage in regenerating a city which for the past 20 years has been known mostly for its religious division and civil unrest. Andrew Simmons, News at 10, Londonderry. The Soviet Foreign Minister, Mr. Shevardnadze, has signed the Soviet Union's first trade pact with the European community. Tomorrow he sees Mrs. Thatcher in London. Our diplomatic correspondent, Geoffrey Archer. Mr. Shevardnadze is eager for better links with West Europe, even embracing the European community flag at one point today. The trade agreement between Moscow and the European community, signed today, would form part of the blueprint for a future greater Europe, Mr. Shevardnadze told EC foreign ministers, including Mr. Douglas Hurd. The agreement provides for a lifting of quotas for Soviet exports to the EC and gives EC firms better access to Soviet markets. The pact will also promote cooperation in nuclear safety, science and transport. This trade agreement still doesn't give the Soviets what they really want, which is access to Western high-technology computer systems. The United States has always been concerned that the export of such equipment to the Soviet Union would simply put it in the hands of the Soviet military and has banned such exports under the COCOM agreement. But there are signs from Washington that even that remnant of the Cold War is beginning to fade. Mr. Shevardnadze welcomed Washington's apparent softening of the COCOM restrictions on technology, but wanted a much bigger gesture. But well, that is only a first step. Personally, I would liquidate COCOM altogether if, it could, if I could decide anything at all. Tomorrow, he makes an historic first visit to the headquarters of NATO. Might he consider joining the Western Military Alliance, he was asked. Well, tomorrow I intend to visit the headquarters of NATO and then we'll look at it and then decide whether it's worth joining or not. <laughs> Behind the jokes, the Soviets, like the Americans, are deadly serious about playing a key role in the future Europe. Geoffrey Archer, News at 10, Brussels. Also in Brussels, Agriculture Minister John Gummer has begun three days of talks with European ministers over Britain's fish quotas. He condemned plans to cut Britain's allocation of cod and haddock as outrageous.
Well, I'm asking them to provide uh, as much fish as is possible for British fishermen. Now, if that means uh, re-discussing with the Norwegians, either formally or informally, then that they must do. What we can't have is a position in which I'm asked to sell to British fishermen a deal which is less than the scientists would allow us, because it's hard enough getting people to support uh, the measures of conservation we need to take without asking them to uh, take something worse than that. Committal proceedings have been started against p and European ferries for corporate manslaughter following the Zeebrugge disaster in 1987. The hearing follows a 15-month police investigation. This is the first case of alleged corporate manslaughter to be heard in England, and court number six here at Highbury was packed as London's chief metropolitan magistrate, Sir David Hopkin, opened the proceedings. Summonses were issued against p and European ferries last June after a 15-month investigation by Kent Police. Separate summonses were served on three former company directors and four employees. Senior Captain John Kirby, the Herald's Master, Captain David Lurie, his first officer, Leslie Sable, and assistant boatswain, Mark Stanley. Also in court today, survivors of the disaster, including Andrew Parker, who used his own body as a bridge to help fellow passengers to safety. A formal committal of this kind is rare nowadays. Evidence and exhibits can be presented to the court and witnesses can be called. Sir David Hopkin must now decide whether the evidence he'll hear is sufficient for the case to go to a full trial. The hearing's expected to last up to three weeks. Robert Hall, News at 10, at Highbury Magistrates Court. Police and customs officials have seized, can have seized cannabis worth two and a half million pounds after a nine-month undercover investigation. The drugs were smuggled into the country at Portsmouth docks in the false fuel tank of an articulated lorry. Three men, one of them a former police officer, were arrested as the cannabis was transferred to another vehicle. The Health Secretary, Mr Clark, has ruled out setting up an independent pay review body for the ambulance service. Earlier, Tory MP Jerry Hayes said that such a move could help settle the dispute. Lord Marshall has resigned as chairman of the Central Electricity Generating Board because government plans exclude nuclear power from electricity privatisation. He'll receive a quarter of a million pounds payoff. Investors in Lloyd's Insurance Syndicates today began legal action against the underwriter they say left many of them facing bankruptcy. Mr Dick Outwaith faces a £200 million lawsuit, the biggest ever legal action involving Lloyd's. Since moving to its controversial new building, Lloyd's has tried to restore a reputation tarnished by scandal in the early 1980s. But the tradition of meeting every insurance claim, however large, has now been undermined. Lloyd's professionals and rich outsiders who were members of Dick Outhwaite's syndicate are suing him because they claim he didn't reveal the risks he was taking. They face huge American claims from asbestos companies who've had to pay compensation to injured workers. Outhwaite's better known syndicate members include Tony Jacklin, Susan Hampshire and Ted Heath. In total, 1,600 of these investors, known as names, will have to pay an average of £130,000 each. Businessman Peter Nutting has had to pay up. He says many names are already near bankruptcy. The whole position could get much worse as the American liability account at Lloyd's deteriorates. And I believe that, that next year there will be many more, perhaps as many as a hundred further names in serious financial difficulties. The man facing the £200 million lawsuit regrets the losses, but says investors should have known the risks. In many ways, when you join Lloyd's, you accept the responsibility uh, of, uh, on syndicates, and you accept the position that syndicates will make profits and losses. It is, I suppose, an unfortunate modern trend that if losses are made, one of the first things that people do is to see if they can find some way of avoiding the loss. Unless the case launched today is settled out of court, it could prove to be the most damaging blow yet to Lloyd's international standing. Just one soccer result tonight in the FA Cup second round, second replay. Burnley 5, Scunthorpe nil. The main points of the news again tonight. The government will announce on Wednesday legislation to allow 200,000 people from Hong Kong to enter Britain. But tonight there are renewed threats of a massive backbench revolt. And reports from Romania say dozens, possibly hundreds, were killed in anti-government demonstrations in Timisoara, the country's third largest city. Finally, a baby who weighed a mere precious 20 ounces when she was born six months ago was allowed to leave hospital and to go home today. Rukaya Bailey was born 18 weeks early and is thought to be the most premature baby to have survived in Britain. But thoughts today were not of records, but of homecoming and Christmas.
When Rakaya Bailey was born in June, 18 weeks premature, she weighed a pathetic 20 ounces and could fit in the palm of her mother's hand. Specialists who'd never heard of a baby surviving such an early birth gave the girl very little chance of lasting more than a few days. But inside the neonatal intensive care unit at Manchester's Hope Hospital, the days became weeks and the weeks became months. Today, six months old and against all the odds, she left the unit for the first time. Although she'll still need regular amounts of oxygen, doctors have decided that at a healthy seven pounds, five ounces, she's fit enough to go home for Christmas. I can't wait to get home. <laughs> I'm not very keen on the word miracle. It's certainly an exceptional and remarkable story of a tough and vigorous baby. But you must also understand that were it not for a lot of dedicated work, particularly by nurses and resident medical staff, she wouldn't have got this far. Baby Rakaya, whose name means gift from God, was then given a special lift home by one of the city's suspended ambulance crews. Terry Lloyd, News at 10, Manchester. And that's News at 10. From Trevor and me, a very good night to you. It may be wise to set your alarm clock a little earlier tomorrow morning. Driving conditions could be quite difficult. Let me set the scene. This is how things started today. That dark area of cloud in the far north, that's the storm that crossed the country during the weekend. It's moving away now. But a new area of low pressure has been moving north during today, bringing a lot of rain, sleet, and some snow too, leaving the roads wet for tonight. And with a the frost, there will be ice around. Over to the west there, well, more rain to come for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. But let's come back to tonight and see a bit more detail. Most of the rain is in the southern half of Britain there. There's some wet snow around as well, already beginning to uh, accumulate on some of the high ground. As we go through the night, the main area of rain is moving away eastwards, but much more of it is turning to wet sleet and snow, so the roads will become very difficult indeed. A cold night too, everywhere a frost, I think, certainly from the Midlands northwards, a widespread frost. In the, in the south there, the frost's a bit more patchy, but even so, temperatures close enough to freezing to cause icy patches on the roads. Now tomorrow, well, there may well be one or two mist and fog patches around to start the day tomorrow. Extra difficulties for drivers, but apart from that, some sunshine, a few wintry showers down the east coast, and especially in East Anglia too, just to start the day, but they should soon clear away, I think. And as we go through the day, the fog will clear, most places staying dry and bright, but some rain coming into the far southwest by the end of the afternoon. A quick look at the temperatures, a cold day, basically. Not too bad in the far south, but everywhere else, well below average. That's it from me. Here's a summary for tomorrow.